Thank you for joining us for Sunday Worship today. If you're looking after children under five and interested in meeting with other parents, grandparents and carers in a warm and friendly setting with great food, fun and friendship, our under fives activities are for you. On Monday mornings during term time at 9am, you can join us in our Hockley location for Bright Stars and at 1pm at our Rayleigh location for Sunbeams. And on Friday mornings between 9.30 and 11.30 a.m., why not join us in either our Rochford or Rayleigh locations for Breakfast Club? See our church websites for further information. If you haven't yet done so, why not join us for Tuesday Fast? It's very simple. You give up breakfast and lunch on a Tuesday, so that by the time you come to your evening meal on a Tuesday, it's roughly 24 hours or so since your last meal. In that time that you are not preparing or eating lunch or breakfast, you have some additional time to pray and to be open to God. So join us this Tuesday for Tuesday Fast. In the description of this video below, you'll find the link to our PayPal giving page. If you're not already supporting our work through one of our local churches, but you'd like to do so, you'll find an easy link below to help you give. If you haven't yet subscribed to this channel, please take a moment to do so. If you click on the notifications button, you'll ensure that you're the first to hear of any new content uploaded to the channel, including new songs that will feature in our worship. Please also like this video if it's a blessing to you. Liking and subscribing are used by YouTube's algorithms to make this video easier to find by others. So by liking and subscribing, we'll be helping to share something of our faith. Are you in need of some spiritual refreshment? Does your faith need a recharge? Perhaps you feel called to explore God in your life for the first time and don't know where to start. If so, our circuit prayer gathering, Recharge Refresh, is for you. Whether you are a Christian who feels stuck in a spiritual rut after the pandemic, in need of a boost to your prayer life, or are seeking something missing from your life, South End and Lee Methodist Circuit will be hosting a special prayer event for those who could do with a recharge for their faith. Join us on Saturday the 29th of October at Rayleigh Methodist Church for our first ever Recharge Refresh prayer gathering. Why not sign up and come along to a day of creative activities to help you connect or reconnect with God? The activities included are suitable for all ages and abilities and can be experienced individually or in a group and include listening for God's small voice through music, seeking God's presence through art, finding the Spirit's peace in nature and creative prayer time. All equipment will be provided so you don't need to bring anything with you. Just turn up ready to relax. Escape from the busyness of your day-to-day -day life and open your hearts and minds to the presence of God. There is plenty of parking at Rayleigh Methodist Church and we will finish just in time to share a soup lunch together which is also provided free of charge. So why not come along to Recharge Refresh at Rayleigh Methodist Church from 10am to 2pm on the 29th of October and give your spiritual life some much needed renewal. Please sign up via Eventbrite so that we can make sure we're well prepared for you. We look forward to seeing you at Recharge Refresh. Good morning and welcome to Covenant Community Online Sunday Worship. I'm Calvin Samuel, Methodist Minister for the Essex towns of Hockley and Hawkwall, Rochford and Rayleigh on the edge of the city of Southend. 
Today we come to the third instalment in our sermon series, Living with Luke, engaging with the lectionary gospel readings between now and the beginning of Advent, all of which come from Luke's gospel. Last week we looked at Luke chapter 15, a collection of parables about the kingdom of God and about seeking the lost. And over the next two weeks, we'll go on to look at Luke chapter 16, beginning with the somewhat troubling parable of the dishonest manager, or what I prefer to call sketchy behavior by students. But we begin with a song of praise. Give thanks to the Lord our God and His love and His Give thanks to the Lord our God and King, His love and His forever. For He is good, He is above all things, His love and His forever. Sing praise. Stretched on his love and juice forever for the life that's been reborn. His love and juice forever. Sing praise, sing praise, sing praise, sing praise. Amen. As we come to our prayers, we begin with a prayer for our new King, King Charles III. Everlasting God, we pray for our new King. Bless his reign and the life of our nation. Help us to work together so that truth and justice, harmony and fairness flourish among us. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let's hear the collect for today. Almighty God, send down upon your church the riches of your spirit and kindle in all who minister the gospel your countless gifts of grace. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. So let us make our confession to God. God our Father, we come to you in sorrow for our sins. For turning away from you and ignoring your will for our lives. Father, forgive us, save us, and help us. For behaving just as we wish without thinking of you. Father, forgive us, save us, and help us. For failing you by what we do and think and say. Father, forgive us, save us, and help us for letting ourselves be drawn away from you by temptations in the world about us. Father, forgive us, save us, and help us. 
for living as if we were ashamed to belong to your Son. Father, forgive us, save us, and help us. In silence, we bring more individual confessions to God. May Almighty God have mercy on us, forgive us our sins, and bring us to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Thanks be to God. Our scripture reading today comes from the Gospel according to Luke. Luke 16, verses 1 to 13. Then Jesus said to the disciples, There was a rich man who had a manager, and charges were brought to him that this man was squandering his property. So he summoned him and said to him, What is this I hear about you? Give me an accounting of your management, because you cannot be my manager any longer. Then the manager said to himself, What will I do now that my master is taking the position away from me? I'm not strong enough to dig, and I'm ashamed to beg. I have decided what to do, so that when I am dismissed as manager, people may welcome me into their homes. So, summoning his master's debtors one by one, he asked the first, How much do you owe my master? He answered, A hundred jugs of olive oil. He said to him, Take your bill. Sit down quickly and make it 50. Then he asked another, And how much do you owe? He replied, A hundred containers of wheat. So he said to him, Take your bill and make it 80. And his master commented, commended the dishonest manager because he had acted shrewdly. For the children of this age are more shrewd in dealing with their own generation than are the children of light. And I tell you, make friends for yourself by means of dishonest wealth, so that when it is gone, they may welcome you into the eternal homes. Whoever is faithful in a very little is faithful also in much. And whoever is dishonest in a very little is dishonest also in much. If then you have not been faithful with the dishonest wealth, who will trust, entrust you to the true riches? And if you have not been faithful with what belongs to another, who will give you what is your own? No slave can serve two masters, for a slave will either hate the one and love the other, or be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and wealth. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be you, to God. Lord. Oh, your mercy never fails me. All my days I've been held in your hands. From the moment that I wake up until I lay my head, I will sing of the goodness. Of God. of 
Amen. As we come to the word, let's pray together. Gracious God, thank you for your goodness and love, and thank you for your word. We pray once more that you would open up your word to our hearts and open up our hearts to your word, so that by your spirit and your word, you might change us to become ever more like you. Amen. The parable of the dishonest manager or the sketchy steward is a problematic one and not easy to understand. In this story we hear that a steward or a manager has been summoned by his master and dismissed because the master has heard that he has been dishonest. He's been squandering the master's property. Based on the latter parts of the story the master appears to be a wealthy landowner operating on a massive scale. The steward is given some time to get his affairs in order and to hand over his accounts. He's out. Notice what he does next. First, the steward neither challenges nor even protests the master's assessment of his misdeeds. This suggests very strongly that he knows himself to be guilty as charged. This is not an honorable man that we're dealing with here. Second, he thinks and moves swiftly. Before he leaves office, he makes sure that he uses his last moments in his position to secure his future. And he does this by radically reducing the debts of some of his master's biggest debtors, so that they would become indebted to him, the steward. And his gamble is that out of gratitude, they would then welcome him into their homes after he's lost his position. This will, of course, not provide a permanent solution, of course, but it would mean that in the short term, he'd have somewhere comfortable to plot his comeback. Third, notice the size of the debts and the size of the reductions. Now, while we're only given two examples in the parable, I suggest that we're meant to understand that the steward did this with far more than two of his master's debtors. He was making sure there were a number of people out there who would be indebted to him. So the first debt, 100 jugs of olive oil, is an enormous amount of oil. 
It's estimated to be roughly the entire annual output from a large olive grove. So to reduce that debt by 50% is an extravagant amount. Similarly, 100 containers of wheat would be something like half the output of about 200 acres of farmland. Reducing that debt by 20% would have a similar market value to 50 jugs of oil. So we're not here describing the debts of individuals to the master. What we're describing here are much more likely to be business debts between one successful merchant, the master, and other less successful ones. The question that immediately arises in my mind and probably in yours is, is this, how could he get away with this? Well, first of all, remember it's a parable. Whether the steward gets away with it or not is not the point of the story. It's a teaching story without too many extraneous details. It's like asking, on what day of the week did the Good Samaritan find the man who was attacked by robbers? No one cares because that's not the point of the story. Or similarly, we might ask whether it was appropriate for Prince Charming to kiss a random princess he found asleep in the middle of an enchanted forest. All sorts of questions of consent arise, don't they? But again, that's not the point of the story. The point of that story is to portray the liberating power of true love and to acknowledge that Snow White was neither in a position to seek assistance nor provide consent to a kiss because she had already been immobilized by the evil queen. But we, we digress. The steward could get away with this because he was empowered, and had been empowered for years, presumably, to act on behalf of his master, to manage the accounts. And crucially, the master's debtors were unaware that he was about to be dismissed. So they believed that he was acting on behalf of his master, as he had always done. Only later would they discover that he was acting on his own, and that they would now be indebted to the steward. But what is startling in the story is that the master commended the dishonest steward for acting shrewdly. Really? Really? You fire this guy because he squandered your money, and then you commend him for acting shrewdly by squandering even more of your money? What's going on here? Well, I suggest that this is perhaps to be taken ironically, perhaps with a somewhat bitter tone by the master. Because he's essentially saying, I see what you did there, well played, you've outsmarted me. It also indicates, by the way, just how wealthy the master is. The loss of these enormous debts to his debtors does not move him to despair. It moves him to admiration at the shrewdness and the creativity of the man he's just fired. And by the way, it's also demonstrated how right the master was for dismissing this man in the first place. This man definitely was a sketchy steward, not really somebody you want in your employ. And yet Jesus uses him as an example in this parable. He goes on to say, the children of this age are more shrewd in dealing with their own generation than are the children of light. Jesus isn't suggesting that we should all find ways of swindling our employers like this sketchy steward. Instead, I suggest that Jesus is drawing attention to the fact that this man could read the signs of the time. He saw very clearly the writing on the wall for his future, and therefore he acted shrewdly, decisively, and swiftly to make sure he was well prepared to face his coming judgment. The children of light, in contrast, that is, the disciples of Jesus like us, are sometimes less astute about reading the times, seeing the future, and acting wisely, decisively, and swiftly to respond to the coming judgment. So Jesus goes on to give an example of the kind of shrewd action he has in mind for the children of light by talking about how wealth ought to be used. Jesus declares, I tell you, make friends for yourselves by means of dishonest wealth, so that when it is gone, they may welcome you into the eternal homes. In other words, Jesus is saying, take a leaf out of the sketchy steward playbook. He used wealth to curry favor with the rich so that they would welcome him into their homes in the future, once he'd been fired and rendered homeless. 
In a similar way, Jesus says, use wealth to make friends for yourselves. But among the poor, so that when your wealth is gone, you can be welcomed into eternal homes. How do you use wealth in this way? By giving it away to the poor and needy. Why? Because everyone who gives to the poor lends to God. So says Proverbs 19 verse 17. So when the wealth is gone, your friends among the poor, to whom the kingdom of God belongs, Luke tells us this in chapter 6 verse 20, they can welcome you into eternal homes. Then Jesus proceeds to flip the script, for he declares, Whoever is faithful in a very little is faithful also in much, and whoever is dishonest in a very little is dishonest also in much. If then you have not been faithful with the dishonest wealth, who will entrust to you the true riches? And if you have not been faithful with what belongs to another, who will give you what is your own? Well, there's so much going on here in these few verses. First of all, Jesus is still talking about wealth here. And it is to wealth that Jesus is referring when he talks about being faithful in a very little. People misquote this verse all the time, I think. We say, if you're faithful in little, you will be faithful in much. By which they mean, if God can trust you with a little bit of money or a little bit of responsibility or a little bit of success, God can therefore trust you with a lot of money or responsibility or success. But that's not how Jesus is using it here. He says, if you can be trusted to use your riches, your wealth, whatever they might be, for the poor, then you can be trusted with something even more valuable. And this is what he makes explicit in verse 11. If you've not been faithful with the dishonest wealth, who will entrust to you true riches? And Jesus here reminds us that true riches is more than economic gain. Because it's a reminder that money and possessions do not really belong to us. We can't take them with us when we die. Whatever it is we think we own, we only have it on loan while we live. When we die, someone else will either inherit or possibly even repossess our stuff. If we've not been faithful with money that does not even belong to us, who will give us something that is ultimately ours? And then Jesus concludes with the final twist in this story. Far from money or possessions being something that we own, if we're not careful, money and possessions can enslave us. So Jesus declares no slave can serve two masters, for a slave will either hate the one and love the other or be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. On that bombshell, Jesus finishes his teaching in this section, this uh, small pericope. Jesus begins with a reflection on a dishonest steward and what he might have to teach the children of God, the children of light, about acting uh, decisively and wisely and swiftly in light of the times. He ends with a warning about wealth and inattention to the poor, which will be picked up in Jesus' next story, which we'll come to next week. Whoever is faithful in a very little. Jesus reminds us that money is not unimportant, especially to those who are poor or in need. But at the end of the day, he classifies it as a very little. Because there are actually more important things in life. And because, if we're not careful, the pursuit of money can enslave us. Jesus encourages us to seek what is more important. Justice, love, generosity. For all these lead to eternal life. Amen.
As we come to our prayers of intercession, if you're joining me live here on YouTube, please do add your own prayers of intercession to the live chat section. If you're joining us uh, later on, uh, the live chat will be disabled, but I'd love to encourage you to add some prayers in the comments below the video, and that means others can share in our prayers. And of course, if you're joining us via audio, please do add your own prayers as we go along. So let us pray. Hi and holy God, robed in majesty, Lord of heaven and earth, we pray that you will bring justice, faith and salvation to all peoples. We pray for our nation, facing a new future with a new king and a new prime minister. Give them wisdom to know and strength to do what is right. Lord, hear us. Lord, graciously hear us. You chose us in Christ to be your people and to be the temple of your Holy Spirit. We pray that you will fill your church with vision and hope and wisdom, the capacity to read the times. Lord, hear us. Lord, graciously hear us. Your Spirit enables us to cry, Abba, Father, affirms that we are fellow heirs with Christ and pleads for us in our weakness. We pray today for all who are in need or distress. We remember especially today our sisters and brothers persecuted for their faith in Christ. Remember in your mercy the family of Chris Kaba, shot and killed by Met Police. Bring healing and justice, we pray. And we pray especially for the people of Ukraine and Pakistan. Lord, hear us. Lord, graciously hear us. In the baptism and birth of Jesus, you have opened heaven to us and enabled us to share in your glory, the joy of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit from before the world was made. May your whole church, living and departed, come to a joyful resurrection in your city of light. Lord, hear us. Lord, 
graciously hear us. In silence, let us commend ourselves and all for whom we pray to the mercy and protection of God. We draw all our prayers together in the prayer that Jesus gave us in its modern form. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. So our final hymn is a declaration of praise on the goodness of God. If you know it, please do join me in singing along. Let the King of my heart be the mountain where I run, the fountain I drink from, oh, he is my song. Let the King of my heart be the shadow where I hide, the ransom for my life, oh, he is my song. You are good.
Amen. Thank you so very much for joining me today for our third installment in our sermon series, Living with Luke. Uh, there are nine more to go. Uh, and next week we return to Luke chapter 16, where Jesus uh, continues his theme, thinking about ways of uh, engaging with the poor. Uh, and all of this section, by the way, is a conversation with the Pharisees, which has begun in chapter 15. Uh, so next week we come to the story of the rich man and Lazarus and it's a fairly good example of some of the issues we've been talking about today where Jesus encourages people of wealth uh, to use that wealth for eternal benefit by giving it to the poor. But join me next week for that. Uh, before then, let's share in a blessing. The Spirit of Truth Lead you into all truth. Give you grace to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord and strengthen you to proclaim the works and word of God and the blessing of God the Father the Son and the Holy Spirit remain with you always amen everything you Jesus one day you will bind every wound the former things shall all pass away no more tears one day you'll make sense of it all Jesus one day every question resolved Every anxious thought left behind No more fear And when we all get to heaven What a day of rejoicing that will be When we all see Jesus We'll sing and shout the victory One day we will see face to face Jesus, is there a greater vision of grace? And in a moment we shall be changed On that day And one day we'll be free, free Jesus, one day all the struggle will cease yeah. And we will see your glory revealed On that day And when we all get to heaven What a day of rejoicing that